Hi everyone, welcome and thank you so much for joining us today for What's the Herd? Reptiles and Amphibians of Washington. My name is Leah Althauser and I use she, her pronouns. I am Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife's Environmental Education Coordinator. And uh, before I begin, I would just like to say that I am joining you from the unceded lands of Nisqually People's Territory who have been caretakers of these lands since time immemorial and continue to uh, be stewards of the land and all of the natural resources. Um, this part of our Wild Washington, this is part of our Wild Washington education program. Wild Washington offers lessons, events, and other fish, wildlife, and natural resource theme educational lessons. And today we just published, uh, you can find it on our website, a uh, Herps in Washington. It's a third through fifth grade lesson that uh, helps students sort of dive even deeper into the world of reptiles and amphibians. A couple housekeeping things, we will be recording this event um, and we have enabled closed captioning, but if you would like to turn it off, um, please click the two C's at the bottom right hand of the corner and you'll see the option for turning off the subtitles. We will not be taking verbal questions, um, so raised hands will not be answered, but if you have a question, please do ask, put it in the Q&A, and then we will uh, answer your question at the end. I'm super excited to introduce our presenter today. Uh, Lamise is one of our WDFW herpetologists, and she's speaking with us today from um, OWDFW wildlife area, Rocky Prairie uh, near Tenino. Uh, Lamise, thank you so much for joining us today. And, and how's the weather out there at Rocky Prairie? It is, it's a little drizzly. So. <laughs> it's a little wet, but it's pretty good. Uh, nice and not too chilly. So got some snakes and some frogs in the background. So, Awesome. Well, I'm excited to learn uh, about reptiles and amphibians and I'll hand it over to you. Cool. Uh, well, hi everyone. Uh, so my name is Lamise Hussain. I am a herpetologist here at the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, and today I thought we would talk about um, some of the more uh, common snake species that you're most likely uh, to see here in Washington. I am sure that many of you have probably seen uh, these little dudes in your gardens and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, just in general, um, so I work a lot with snakes, uh, but I also work a lot with uh, frogs and salamanders, um, a little bit with lizards, and then with Western pond turtles. Um, some of the more common species that we run into as far as amphibians go um, are Pacific tree frogs, um, and they... I always like introducing those, uh, these kind of frogs because they are our smallest frogs here in Washington, uh, but they are actually some of our loudest ones. Um, they are most likely the frogs that you hear at night. And sometimes if you're near wetlands or ponds, uh, they can be pretty deafening. Um, they're like the tiny, tiny little green frogs. Uh, sometimes you can see them uh, with like a brownish color. Um, sometimes they can be green and brown. Sometimes they're a little gold. Um, but they're really cool little frogs. Um, and like I said, they are our loudest frogs here in Washington, even though they are our smallest. Um, and a really fun fact about those guys is they can actually, in the right environmental conditions, change colors. Uh, so if you ever see a little tree frog, you'll notice that they have a little mask on and that their little uh, toe pads are... Uh, circular, which is what helps them kind of climb up uh, the side of trees, uh, the side of your house, um, the side of cars, you know, uh, grass and like different things like that. Um, so that's also a really good way to identify them. But if you take a look at this picture on the screen, you'll notice that this little guy has like kind of a little mask around his eye. And so that'll always be there. Um, but like I said, in the right environmental conditions, this little green frog could actually turn to kind of like a greenish brown color. Um, and we have definitely be, been tricked uh, multiple occasions before uh, <laughs> by having a little green frog in a bucket, getting ready to process them and take data on them. And then all of a sudden we look down and now we have something like what is on the screen. And sometimes that can be a little bit confusing, but 
they're really cool little frogs. And like I said, they are some of the most common frogs here in Washington. Um, and they are our loudest ones. Um, and one of their predators is actually uh, the snakes that I have here today. Um, so I have four, uh, there are three species of garter snakes here in Washington, and I have four different kinds of garter snakes here with me, um, mainly because like garter snakes actually come in a variety of colors, which is really cool. Um, and these are really underrated snakes. Like everybody thinks that garter snakes aren't very neat because they're so common. Um, but these guys actually have some pretty interesting um, adaptations that make them uh, really neat little snakes. Um, so one of the coolest things that I like telling people about garter snakes is one of the things that they eat are rough skin newts. Now, rough skin newts are an amphibian that we have here um, in Washington State, um, but they are actually one of the most toxic animals in the U.S., which is super crazy. So Ruskin newts emit what's called tetrodotoxin, or TTX. And, and it could actually be like pretty devastating to humans, with some populations even being potent enough to kill a human. Um, so the thing I always tell people is don't go sticking salamanders uh, in your mouth. Uh, don't eat them. <laughs> it's not a good idea. Um, but because Ruskin newts are so toxic, and they're pretty prevalent here in the Pacific Northwest, like you've probably seen a Ruskin newt before hanging out in a wetland. You know, they have those bright orange bellies. Um, and because they are so potent, uh, there is only one animal in the world that can eat them, and that's actually these guys. Um, so garter snakes are the only – saying hi <laughs> – Garter snakes are some of the only animals that can actually eat Ruskin newts, which is super cool. And so they kind of create this nice arms race, like, over their evolution. So as the Ruskin newts become more toxic, uh, garter snakes actually build up a stronger immunity. And so it goes back and forth and back and forth, which is why we have some populations of Ruskin newts that become so potent that they could kill humans. Um, so it's really neat. And garter snakes, like other snakes that we have here in Washington, are actually really helpful when it comes to like your garden or your farm or anything like that because they keep rodent populations down, uh, which helps with, you know, like rodents like eating, you know, things in your garden, right? Like I think most of us have had the problem of like a mouse chewing on our peas or, you know, like rabbits getting into things um, or just really just having like mice or anything in your house. And that's why snakes actually come in handy because snakes actually keep our rodent population stable and lower. So not only does that help with damage or property damage, uh, but it also reduces disease because we know that rodents can carry different diseases because they carry ticks or they carry fleas and stuff like that. So these little guys are really cool to have around. Um, garter snakes are very, very, very mildly venomous, um, but the venom does not affect humans or anything. So even if these guys bite you, it is not that big of a deal. Uh, this big girl right here um, is a really, really pretty snake. So I don't know if you guys can see that or not, but she's got this really pretty blue color on her underside. Um, she's a pretty thick bodied snake. Uh, we have found garter snakes before that are about three feet. Uh, so you can imagine they can get uh, pretty big. And like I said, they're one of our more common snakes here in Washington. Um, and one of the ways that we actually sex snakes um, so the way that we tell whether or not they're a boy or a girl, if she'll let me do, I know, I know, it's so rude of me. I, I shouldn't, I shouldn't be showing people this. Um, so if you can see right here, this is going to be her vent or her cloaca, right? And so this is where she like screeps everything and stuff like that, but that's also where she mates. And so a way that you can tell males and females apart is if the tail tapers down immediately, that's going to tell us that this is a female snake. And if it doesn't, and it stays pretty thick and pretty boxy all the way down, then that's a male snake. And that's because we know that male snakes have hemipenes, um, and so they need areas for that hemipene to go. And sometimes if we have a snake that's a little questionable, um, you can actually push on it a little bit, and the hemipenes will pop out. And so that's how we know that it's a male snake. Um, so yeah, uh, these guys are really, really neat. Um, they typically hang out around uh, wetlands, but sometimes we do see them in like our uh, shrub step and stuff like that. Um, they primarily eat uh, 
small rodents. Sometimes they'll eat bugs, um, but they like they really like eating amphibians. So a lot of times we will see some of them hanging around eating our frogs and eating salamanders and newts, like I said. Um, so this is one of the bigger ones uh, that I brought. And then another cool fact about uh, garter snakes, and this actually applies to rattlesnakes too. So a lot of people think that all snakes lay eggs, and that's not always the case. So with garter snakes and rattlesnakes and a few of our other species here in Washington, they actually give birth to live young, which is super cool. Um, and so what happens is they have the eggs inside their bodies, and so the eggs are fertilized inside their bodies, and those eggs hatch out, and then the mother gives birth to live young. So it's not exactly the same as what humans go through, um, but it's a little similar. So this is also a garter snake, but this is actually a different species. And I don't know if you guys can see, God, uh, see that, but this little one is a little more orange. Um, you can see that really beautiful, like orange stripe going down the back. Um, and they're a lot smaller, right? Like, so this one's a lot smaller than the bigger one that I just showed you. Um, and for the most part, they're pretty chill. Um, some of the defense mechanisms that these guys use um, and that a lot of the other snakes use is uh, they will poop on you first. Uh, so they emit a really, really nasty musk um, out of that vent that I showed you. Um, and it is very pungent. And my coworkers always make fun of the fact that when snake season starts and I'm out there collecting snakes, I pretty much just smell like a snake for a couple of months. Um, and it is not a very pleasant smell. Um, and they will resort to a lot of different things before uh, they ever decide to bite. And that goes for rattlesnakes, too. Um, so a lot of people think that rattlesnakes, like, immediately will bite you. And that's not always the case. Um, snakes, like any other wild animal, uh, will only resort to biting you if they feel like they're being cornered um, or they feel like they can't get out. And so a lot of times, like, especially what garter snakes do, um, and we see a lot of rattlesnakes do this, too, they freeze. Um, so we've had situations at our rattlesnake dens where the rattlesnakes will stay really, really quiet. So they don't rattle at you or anything. They're just sitting there. They're hoping that you just go away, that you pass by them. And then when that doesn't work, like say I found, uh, this little girl and her sitting still didn't work and I pick her up, uh, then her first reaction is going to be to poop on me. And it's a pretty good defense, um, for other predators, right? Because nothing wants to eat a really nasty like tasting or smelling thing um and so they'll go and they'll musk you and they'll flip their tails around and so it's just spreading everywhere um and then like I said a last resort is you know a snake if it can't get away from you um if it feels like it's being threatened if it feels like you're trying to eat it or something then the snake will try to bite you um we only have one venomous snake uh, here in Washington um, that is potentially hazardous to people, and that is our Northern Pacific rattlesnakes. Uh, but if you are on the western side of the state, uh, you do not have to worry about those guys. Um, so the only snakes that we really have here on the western side are the three species of garter snakes and then rubber boas, which if you are ever lucky enough to find a rubber boa, they are some of the sweetest sweetest little snakes um and again super important to their ecosystems um a lot of myths that people have uh about snakes uh is that snakes will chase you uh and we get that a lot with our rattlesnakes um and <laughs> more often than not what's happening when a snake is quote unquote chasing somebody is that oh yeah this is a picture of a rubber boa they are the derpiest looking snakes that we have here in washington um, but they are just, they are so sweet. And usually what they do when you pick them up is they will wrap around your hand, uh, and then just give you a big old hug around your hand. Uh, they very rarely bite. Um, and, uh, sorry, I got distracted by a bird. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, so one of the common misconceptions that we get, especially about rattlesnakes, um, is the fact that rattlesnakes are trying to chase you. Uh, so rattlesnakes get irritated and they come at people. But generally speaking, what's happening in those situations is the person is standing in the way of the hole or whatever that the rattlesnake is trying to get to to get away from you. Um, like I said, rattlesnakes and a lot of these other snakes 
are actually like really cool creatures. Um, and for the most part, like they never want to hurt you. Like that's never their intention. Um, the old saying that, you know, snakes are more afraid of you than you are of them is absolutely true. Um, I'm going to pull this one snake out because she's not very happy with me. Um, but she's a really beautiful colored snake and we see these types of garters a lot. So she's kind of similar to the bigger one I showed you, but she's a little more blue. Let's focus on the snake and not on my face. <laughs> she's a little more camera shy, but she's a little more blue than the other one. Um, and you see these guys a lot, uh, especially if you ever go to the uh, Nisqually National Wildlife Refuge. A lot of the garter snakes there are the beautiful, like, blue-colored snakes. Um, but, yeah, snakes are super, super important to our ecosystem. And one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about snakes a little more than amphibians today is because snakes get a really bad rep, right? Like, a lot of people are afraid of snakes. You know, they're kind of weird. They don't have any legs. They don't have any arms. So, you know, like, they move, like, pretty quickly for something that doesn't have any limbs, and it freaks people out a lot. Um, but the fact of the matter is snakes are some of our most important animals in our ecosystems. Like, not only do they help keep populations of rodents and stuff down, um, but they actually provide a pretty good food source for a lot of animals, uh, even rattlesnakes. So there are a lot of things that will actually eat rattlesnakes and that can eat rattlesnakes. Um, and so they provide a pretty good food source for them as well. Um, but yeah, I snakes are my go-to animal. Uh, they are one of my favorite um, you know, species to work with and stuff like that. You know, I get to work with garter snakes a lot, but I also work with rattlesnakes. Um, we have a lot of different species, about 18 species of snakes here in Washington, um, and they're all super cool. And the thing that I always tell people about snakes is, you know, they're cool to watch from afar, right? Um, you know, if you just kind of sit there and like observe their behavior from like a safe distance and don't startle them, it's really fun to just watch and see what they're doing. And, you know, a lot of times they're just chilling. They're just hanging out on a log, just trying to absorb like, you know, the sun and stuff like that. Um, but if you ever come across a snake and you are not sure what it is, don't ever pick it up. Um, like I said, like snakes don't like being picked up very much. Uh, and a lot of times bites that happen specifically with rattlesnakes and stuff like that, uh, more often than not tend to be from people who are trying to move them out of a trail or people who are trying to kill them. Um, and so please don't kill snakes there. I know that rattlesnakes can be really scary, uh, but they are really not trying to hurt you, um, in the least bit. And especially garter snakes. Look at these little faces. Like, come on now. That's not trying to hurt you. It might poop on you, but they're not trying to hurt you. Um, but yeah, um, they're really cool little animals. So I think that's really all I've got about snakes. Uh, I guess some basic things uh, about them. Uh, the reason why you see them basking uh, on logs and stuff and absorbing rays is uh, they are cold blooded. Uh, so what they do is they absorb the heat uh, from the sun or from any type of, you know, like metal or anything like that, that's got like a lot of heat absorption or even the road. Uh, so you'll see a lot of snakes on the road sometimes like during the summer, like late at night. And so what they're doing is they're absorbing that heat um, because they can't produce that heat themselves uh, like we can, right? Like we can regulate our temperatures and stuff without, you know, outside, you know, like sun or anything like that. But snakes can't do that and reptiles can't do that. And so they rely on heat sources in order to do that. So the warmer they get, uh, the faster they can move, the faster they can digest and stuff. And he's peed on me. <laughs> so... Um, one of the things that we use to actually uh, look for snakes, um, and it, it proves to be a pretty good uh, method, is we use what are called cover boards. And so cover boards can really be anything from like a random piece of metal that you find or a random piece of wood. And so you lay it down flat on the ground um, and snakes and amphibians and bugs and stuff will usually go under there because it'll absorb heat and provides like a good source of heat underneath the cover board while at the same time protecting the snake from any type of predators or anything. Um, it can also be a fast food meal because sometimes little rodents or little bugs and stuff like that will come under the cover boards with the snakes, and they're like, ooh, well, that was easy. Um, but, yeah, so, yeah, besides that, it's a little chilly this morning, so they're not 
moving as great uh, or as quickly or anything as they normally would be. Uh, in the midst of the summer, when it's really warm, these guys are really, really fast. And some of our faster snakes that we have here in Washington are the yellow belly racers and then the stripe whip snakes. And when I tell you that they're fast, sometimes like all we catch is just a quick glance of them and then they're gone. And it's really amazing to think that an animal that does not have any limbs can move that quickly. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's all I've got about, all I've got about snakes for now. So I'm open to any questions that people might have. I, sorry, I was muted. <laughs> um, I just learned a lot about snakes. Thank you so much for, for showing us those. <laughs> That was really, yeah. really neat. I didn't know that we had four different types of garter snakes. Yeah. So we have all sorts of questions for you. So um, my first question, and I think maybe this has to do with uh, lizards maybe, is how do they grow back their limbs? Oh, okay. So that's a really good question. Um, so we see that in lizards. So lizards will often drop their tails if you try to capture them. Um, but we also know that salamanders, uh, can regenerate limbs too. So they're amphibians, they're not reptiles like lizards. Um, and all of that happens through like a really, really long drawn out like process in their body. And so it takes a lot of energy for them to do that. Um, and a lot of times, like depending on like the other things that they're trying to do, uh, it'll take longer or like a shorter duration of time. Uh, so if they're really young and they're trying to like grow, into an animal sometimes it can take a little longer versus if they're an adult and you know they've been eating well and stuff like that like there's no type of like uh deficiency that they have sometimes they can grow back a little quicker um but it's a really complicated like internal process that happens um that's so why i always tell people too to be really careful um when they try to catch lizards um lizards are they're some of the hardest animals uh for us to catch especially under cover boards because again they're fast uh, but they will drop that tail like pretty immediately. <laughs> um, and salamanders will do the same thing. And a lot of times, like if you ever see a lizard or a salamander drop their tail, uh, it'll wiggle around and that's a predator deterrent, right? So the predator is going to go after that tail so that the rest of the animal can get away. But it is really like taxing um, on the animal too. Like it takes a lot of energy for them to grow all of that back. So. Well, it's impressive that they can grow them back, but it's good to know that it shouldn't pick them up. Just enjoy with our eyes. Yeah. <laughs> Were reptiles and amphibians alive in dinosaur times? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, so we actually know that amphibians um, uh, came from Tiktaalik, right? So Tiktaalik is kind of like our first transitional animal from sea to land. And so we always consider that like our first kind of amphibian. And so amphibians actually came around before reptiles did. Um, and then reptiles were kind of, they technically, yes, they were around during like the dinosaur age and stuff like that. Um, but dinosaurs have like a couple different lineages. Some of them evolved into mammals. Some of them evolved into birds and stuff like that. And then there's a smaller lineage uh, that included these guys. Um, there are of course like, you know, fossils of like Titanoboa and stuff like that. So like giant snakes and, you know, like you have crocodiles and alligators and stuff like that too. Uh, so reptiles, definitely during dinosaurs, amphibians have been around much longer. Hmm. That's cool. I think because reptiles are sort of so dinosaur looking, you would think that they're older. So it's cool to know that amphibians are actually mm -hmm. older. Yeah. Our next question is, what is the deadliest reptile? The deadliest reptile? Oh man. Okay. Like, so in the US, I guess, if we're talking about like, like in Washington, our deadliest one, uh, reptile wise, is definitely going to be, you know, our Northern Pacific rattlesnake. Uh, if we're talking about herps in general in Washington, Ruskin newts uh, might be a little more toxic if you eat them. Uh, in America, there are a couple of different venomous species that we have. Uh, most of them occur in southeastern United States or southwestern United States. So we have like the Mojave rattlesnake. We do have some coral snakes um, and they're in kind of like a different family than uh, our rattlesnakes are, but they can be pretty potent. 
though their mouths are pretty small. Um, if we're talking worldwide, there's a couple different factors that go into this. So taipans are generally considered more potent than any other animal. However, black mambas and a couple of snakes like that are considered deadlier because even though their venom isn't as potent as taipans, they tend to bite a lot more. Um, and so, you know, person for person, they kill more people than taipans do. Uh, taipans are usually kind of like garter snakes. They don't really want to bite you. Black mamas don't really want to bite you either. They just unfortunately get pushed in with people a lot. And so they're in more contact with people. And so they bite a lot more often. What do Pacific tree frogs eat? Uh, <laughs> so Pacific tree frogs eat bugs. Uh, when they're tadpoles, uh, like many other tadpoles, they'll usually just kind of eat like uh, leaf litter or just kind of like detritus or kind of like anything in the water. Sometimes they'll eat aquatic insects, but they don't really have like a lot of sophisticated mouth parts for that. But yeah, as adults, they really like bugs. Um, some of the amphibians that we do have, so some of the frogs uh, that are in Washington, like uh, we do have invasive bullfrogs here in Washington. Those guys uh, will actually eat anything they can fit in their mouth. Uh, so we have seen bullfrogs take down western pond turtles. Uh, we have seen bullfrogs take down birds and small mammals. Uh, we have a couple of other amphibians, um, like Pacific giant salamanders, that will do the same. Um, but yeah, tree frogs are really small, so they just like bugs. <laughs> what types of diseases or sicknesses do snakes get? Um, so one of the diseases that we are actually looking out for right now is called snake fungal disease. Um, and generally what happens is, um, maybe I get the bigger one out for this. So generally what happens with snake fungal disease is snakes uh, end up getting these lesions uh, kind of on their skin and on their faces. Um, and what happens is it's kind of like whiteness syndrome in bats, right? Um, so it causes the snakes to get really uncomfortable um, during their um, hibernation period. So snakes and a lot of reptiles, like during the winter, it's too cold for them. And so they go into these tabernaculas or little dens and stuff like that. And the dens can go pretty deep into the ground. Um, and so what we see a lot, like especially on the East Coast with snake fungal disease, is it causes the snakes to wake up. And so they're going out like into the cold to bask and, you know, try to like kind of shed all of this stuff off but it's cold, right? And so it's not good for the snake, um, just kind of like white nose syndrome. Um, and we see it um, particularly a lot in rattlesnakes uh, back east. Um, but what will happen too is it'll kind of look like the snake. So if you've ever seen a snake in shed, uh, their eyes will uh, turn blue, right? Um, and that's called like going blue for snakes because they're getting ready to shed all of their skin. And that includes the little eye cap over their eye. With snake fungal disease, the eyes usually look really gnarly. And so it kind of looks like they're shedding, but it's almost like this lesion like on their eye. And so a lot of times when we've been looking for snake fungal disease, like especially in rattlesnakes, um, we check their faces a lot uh, because that's where the disease seems to be like most prominent in those species. Um, but yeah, it typically looks like really nasty lesions on them. We haven't had any cases yet in Washington, um, but it's something that we're keeping our eye out for because like most diseases in animals, we know that it's just kind of a matter of time before it gets here. And so, you know, we're trying to be really like cognizant about, you know, the species that we know it's going to affect more, um, keeping an eye on them. And then if it does get here, figuring out, okay, like what are our next steps? Like, what do we do now? That's the only one that I know of with snakes. I know like uh, if you keep snakes as pets, there's a couple of other things that they can get. But as far as wild snakes go, snake fungal disease is the main one that, that I've been paying attention to. No, thank you. If someone finds a garter or snake in their garden, is it safe to pick it up? It is safe to pick it up. Uh, like I said, it will poop on you and it might, it might bite if it feels threatened. Um, but like I said, they are not like venomous to people. Uh, so it's not, it's not really going to amount to anything. I have been bitten by many snakes and garter snakes are probably the least painful <laughs> that I have been bitten by. Um, you always want to make sure you know that it is most definitely a garter snake though. Um, to be fair, they're only really going to be, if 
if your garden is in central or eastern Washington, there's really only going to be like two other snakes that are going to look kind of similar to rattlesnakes. So gopher snakes and then uh, night snakes can look kind of similar to them. Um, for the most part, garter snakes, you know, the nice black coloration. Some of them have brown in the background. Um, but yeah, as long as you definitely know that it's a garter snake, yeah, you can go for it, pick it up, be gentle with it. You know, um, what I always tell people, uh, snakes get really uncomfortable when you pin them behind the head. And so if you ever, you know, pick up a garter snake or anything like that, like gently picking it up and stuff like that, letting it move like throughout your hand. Um, but yeah. For the most part, I tell people they usually leave snakes alone because some people, you know, if you don't identify a snake ride, it can be really dangerous. Um, but they're really cool feeling animals. So I understand. I mean, obviously, I grew up picking up snakes and that's why I have the job that I have now. So, so I noticed with the snakes that you've been holding that they keep uh, sticking out their tongue. Can you talk about what they're doing when they do that? Yeah. Um, so when a snake sticks out its tongue, what it's doing is trying to see its surroundings, right? And so it picks up particles uh, from the air and flicks them back into its little nostrils. Uh, and those particles go to what's called a Jacobson organ. And that Jacobson organ kind of helps them see like their surroundings around them. So although some snakes do have pretty good sight, uh, this kind of helps them pinpoint a lot of things. Um, with things like pit vipers, so like rattlesnakes, you can actually see the pits like pretty clearly on their face. Um, and uh, yeah, so basically what they're doing is they're kind of like flicking their tongue around. They're kind of like testing the air. They're figuring out, you know, like what's around them. Like, especially when you hold them up to the camera, they're just like, what's this thing? You know, like it kind of looks like an eye, but it doesn't like, you know, my senses aren't picking up that it's moving or anything like that. Um, so yeah, it actually just really helps them like gauge their surroundings. Um, it helps them when they're hunting a lot too. Uh, so you can actually watch snakes track mice and different things like that um, by like using their tongue a lot and picking up those signals so they can see like which direction the mouse is going and stuff. Um, some snakes like uh, rattlesnakes are ambush predators. And so they'll kind of like set up on the side of like a, you know, little mouse trail or something like that, because they've picked up the particles that they know, you know, like there's an animal that comes through here. And so they'll sit on the side of the trail and they'll flick their tongue out every once in a while to try to pick up if there's anything around them. And especially with rattlesnakes, that kind of helps them like pinpoint right where to strike and stuff like that. Um, so yeah. That is so cool. <laughs> um, what is the biggest snake in the world? Oh, man. Uh, hmm. I'm not like entirely sure. I want to say it's between rock pythons and green anacondas, but don't quote me on that. <laughs> Time Usually for some boas research. and pythons are our biggest ones. Do we have uh, so any I will say... Oh, go ahead. You finish your thought. Uh, I was going to say, uh, we do know that, um, I mean, we have snakes like king cobras, right, and black mambas that can get, like, 19 feet uh, in length, but they're not quite as, like, girthy as, like, anacondas or, like, you know, rock pythons are, so. Um, do we have any endangered snakes in Washington or threatened? Any that are, that are not doing well? <laughs> yeah, so we have two snakes uh, that... One of them is state listed and the other one um, we're looking at as like a species of concern. So striped whip snakes are one of them and our California mountain king snakes are actually another one. And a lot of those, uh, especially the California mountain king snakes, so we are at the northernest, uh, the most northern point of their range, right? And the same with the striped whip snakes. Um, and so we don't have as huge of populations as like Oregon and California do. Um, a big problem that we see with California mountain king snakes is they are really, really beautiful snakes. So they're super colorful. Uh, they kind of look like coral snake mimics, um, and they only occur in a very small part of Washington. Um, and what generally happens is people will collect them for the pet trade. Um, and the same thing goes for rubber boas because they're such sweet snakes. A lot of people think that they make good pets. Um, and so habitat loss as well as pet trade and stuff like that has made it really difficult for those snakes. Uh, but yeah, California mountain king snakes and striped whip snakes are some of the snakes, especially when we talk about snake fungal disease, you know, that we're keeping a very close eye on and that we do a lot of work with like genetics and stuff like that with. 
So that leads us to our next question. Can people collect snakes and frogs to keep as pets? No. <laughs> so you should never uh, collect any type of wild snake or wild frog to keep as a pet, especially in Washington. So it does go against DFW regulations and stuff like that. Um, but there's also a lot of other issues that come along with that, right? So collecting snakes and frogs can also lead them to getting diseases uh, that normal, like say you collected um, a frog from the wild, right? And you brought it in and you had, you know, like a pet frog or some other type of pet that you had kept in the same container. It is possible to transfer diseases that way. Um, but then also, you know, we get into the problem of like, like I said, the pet trade and stuff, right? And so more people go out and like collect amphibians and collect snakes, all of a sudden we're like losing a huge population, you know, because people want them as pets. And I mean, I get it. They are awesome, awesome animals. Um, I know a lot of people will go out and pick up tadpoles and, you know, like rear them uh, and then basically release them. And the thing that I always tell people, like when it comes to that is you can kind of like watch them in the wetlands uh, that they're in. They don't move uh, a lot. And so, you know, you can kind of like watch them, you know, like grow and stuff like that instead of bringing them inside and then re-releasing them and stuff. Great. Thank you. What are the yellow snakes in Washington? Yellow snakes in Washington. Uh, so we have, so the main yellow snake uh, are yellow belly racers, right? So they're kind of like an olive color on top and they have a really beautiful yellow belly. Uh, and like I said, they are really fast. Like they're called racers uh, for a reason. Um, so they're really fast. Sometimes gopher snakes uh, can look a little yellow too, um, but they're kind of kind of resemble rattlesnakes a little more. So they have kind of like a tannish yellow color and like a rattlesnake will also have a tannish yellow color with like little diamonds and stuff on their back. Um, but yeah, yellow belly racers are usually our, our bright yellow ones. Cool. So going back to the dinosaur question, what did snakes evolve from? Ooh, that's a good question. Huh. I mean, I would assume, unless I saw a phylogenetic tree, I would assume probably like the amphibian lineage, right? So like things coming from Tiktaalik and stuff like that, like we talked about earlier, um, and then eventually evolving into separate things uh, and like into like the different types of reptiles and stuff like that. I'm not an evolutionary biologist, so I can give you like a good answer to that one. <laughs> an opportunity for someone to do more research. <laughs> <laughs> What is the best weather to find snakes or other reptiles? Um, that's a good question. Uh, so typically what we see is uh, kind of this weird little bell curve when it comes to reptiles. And so a lot of people think that you can find snakes and lizards more often in like the hottest parts of the summer. Um, but snakes have kind of like this thermal threshold, right? And so they don't like getting like super hot. Um, and so usually the best time that we find uh, snakes is when they're starting to come out of their dens. Uh, so typically anywhere from like late March to end of May, beginning of June uh, is when you'll see the most of them. Uh, they'll kind of start tapering off a little bit during the summer because it gets a little too hot. So unless you go out kind of like at night and stuff like that, you're more likely to find them then. Um, and then you'll kind of peak back up uh, in September, like late August, like into September when they're going back to their dens. Um, and a lot of snakes will actually go back to the same den. So um, they typically kind of like, they'll come out from their dens in the spring. They'll kind of spread out to like their feeding sites and stuff like that. And then they'll kind of come back to them in the winter, you know, to go through like their little hibernation and stuff. So I typically tell people if you want to see snakes, uh, the best time to go is usually like late spring, early summer. Um, in the summer, if you are looking for reptiles, uh, we typically do like night cruises and stuff like that, because like the roads are pretty warm at night, right? You know, but it's not as hot outside. So they retain a lot of that heat. And so those are some of the other surveys that we do or like uh, cruising surveys and stuff, so. Cool, that sounds fun. Um, what is your favorite reptile or amphibian and why? Ooh, um, I'm actually, as dangerous as they are, I'm actually pretty partial to black mambas. Uh, they are some of the most beautiful snakes, I think, on the planet. 
Um, I am also very partial to timber rattlesnakes uh, because I grew up in Kentucky. Uh, So timber rattlesnakes were some of the prettier uh, snakes that we had back there. Um, And like mainly because they just get bad reps, right? Like, you know, people always vilify snakes, but they're actually these really beautiful creatures and they really don't want to hurt anybody. It's just kind of, you know, it's like any other wild animal. If you would stumble upon a tiger, you know, like in the wild and stuff like that and corner it, a tiger isn't going to react very well to that. Um, but yeah, black mamas. As far as like amphibians go, uh, we have a lot of really cool amphibians here. Uh, I really like Van Dyke salamanders. Uh, so they're endemic to Washington. So you can't find them anywhere else in the world. Um, and they're like these little golden trinket type of salamanders. So like sometimes they're like a rosy red color or sometimes they're like this nice bright orange or sometimes they're like this golden yellow like they're really cool salamanders and it's really cool that you can only find them here so that's super neat i'm gonna have to go look them up we have Uh, a couple more questions for you lamise um our next one is where are popcorn snakes found i don't know if popcorn yeah (laughs) popcorn is in quotes i'm not sure what a popcorn if you don't know, I'm not sure either. I, I don't know what a popcorn thing is. <laughs> um, if that was your question and you, you want to put in some clarification, uh, we'll, we'll give you a minute to do that. And then um, our next question for you, Lamise, is how do I get a job like yours? Oh, man. <laughs> Uh, so the crew that I'm on, uh, we do take volunteers out with us sometimes, um, and we are currently trying to set up like an internship and stuff like that. Um, my best advice is contacting, you know, if there is a professor at a college in your area, even if you're young, like being like middle school and high school and stuff like that, like contacting a professor in your area. Uh, going to zoos, uh, Woodland Park Zoo has really good, like, you know, outreach programs and stuff like that. And really just like getting involved with it, like as much as possible, um, getting your name out there and stuff like that and networking a lot. Um, yeah, I, I have a really big passion for snakes and everybody knows that. (laughs) Um, and I made sure that everybody knew that. Um, and so any opportunity that I got to work with snakes, um, I did it. And I, I mean, if it's any consolation, like I didn't get my wildlife degree until much later in life because I didn't even realize that you could be a wildlife biologist. Like I thought people like Steve Irwin and stuff like that were just TV personalities. And I never saw anybody who looked like me in this field. Right. And so I didn't even realize you could be a biologist until somebody came up and told me, Hey, you like snakes a lot. Have you ever thought about doing this? And I'm like, I didn't think I could do that like as a job. And then so here I am. <laughs> well, I'm so happy that you're here because I've learned so much from you today and, and I hope that everyone else has too. And you really bring a passion to, to reptiles and snakes. Um, a popcorn snake is a corn snake. So where are corn snakes? Oh, corn snakes. <laughs> oh, uh, so we do not have any popcorn corn snakes here in Washington. Um, we do have them back east. So in Kentucky, we did have corn snakes. Um, Typically speaking, I don't think we have them in the Pacific Northwest. So they're more of like a Southern species or a Midwest species. Thank you. We'll sneak in one. Nice. (laughs) We'll sneak in one last question. What is the world's biggest frog? Oh, man. I don't know. There's some massive cane toads are really big. Uh, There are certain types of bullfrogs that can get pretty big. I... (laughs) I don't know, there's some pretty big frogs, especially uh, when you get into Australia. Australia has some pretty big frogs, uh, but yeah. Like how big can you do like a, I'm, I'm trying to visualize, like this big? We've seen cane toads down in Florida that are about like that big. So I mean, they're oh. <laughs> That's crazy. Oh, and um, my colleague wrote the Goliath frog might be the largest one so well nice Lamise this has been absolutely wonderful thank you so much for all of your knowledge and information and and just your passion and and bringing it to Washington um yeah I hope that you have a great day and thank you everyone for joining we really appreciate you tuning in to learn about snakes and 
Our next Wild Washington presentation is May 14th, and that will be at 10 a.m. as well. You can find it on our website or uh, the event on our website or on our Facebook page, and that's all about wildlife disease of Washington. We'll have one of our veterinarians uh, speaking with students. Thank you so much for joining everyone, and I hope you have a great weekend. Thanks, Lamise, and thanks, Little Garter Snake. Yeah, bye, guys. Bye. <laughs>